Not just supplements and functional foods Legal developments and greedy news Education, inspiration, entertainment Inside in the afternoon Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Insider in the Afternoon uh, thanks for joining us, Todd Runstead here, senior editor here at Natural Products Insider and Informa. And uh, this is a really special show that we got today because live events are back in action. And we have the footage to prove it. Last week was Supply Side East. It's a thing. It happened there in Secaucus, New Jersey. And we have Steve Myers, our very own, and Sandy Almandaris. They were there. And kids, why don't you join us and join the conversation? Let's have a little talk. How are you guys doing? Uh, Hi, we're Tom. doing great. Happy to be here. Yeah, yeah. So I'm really curious about, about that event. Can we just like talk for a few minutes about it? I mean, first of all, I mean, people showed up. Was it an intimate affair? What was the vibe like? Well, I can jump in. I think I was actually the one to arrive first. And what's interesting is I was cruising in my lift ride from Newark Airport to Secaucus to the Meadowlands you could see the tropical storm hovering over New York on its way out. And then by nighttime, it was crystal clear stargazing. It was kind of a perfect metaphor for the start of Supply Side East after the year we've had. And yes, I was as apprehensive as anybody else. How would travel be? Check, it was pretty good, especially with TSA pre-check. And then how would the show floor be like? Would it be too crowded? Would people respect my choice to wear a mask? How would we greet each other? Would we even know who we are after all this time? I had some elbow bumps, some fist bumps, and then some people not sure what to do. There were a few hugs when people were comfortable. And most of all, um, whether someone had a mask on or not, everybody seemed to respect everyone else's wishes. And, and that's what I thought the vibe was. That's cool. Hey, Sandy, what do you think? What, what was your uh, situation? I loved it. And one thing that was really great about being in person was that I wasn't in my home and having videos disrupted by my dogs barking. I'm not sure if you've just heard them, but anyway, yeah, similar to Steve, I mean, getting in wasn't as smooth for me because I live in Phoenix. And so it was quite a farther trip for me and my flight was rescheduled, et cetera, et cetera. I think travel is, you gotta be flexible with the airlines now. They're, they've went through some hard times, so. Uh, but I landed and went right into the city and within an hour of landing was on a New York City rooftop. And it was like, oh, I'm back. I'm back with industry people. I'm in person. And I wore a mask the whole time, like Steve. But I also fell for the hugs that I just was missing so much, even though I went in thinking like this is going to be a distance thing. But I just you see people and you're just so excited to be in person. So I just, I loved it. And I, it just really underscored how much I missed everybody. I love that. I, I, I was really kind of curious as to like, what was the elbow bump to hug ratio, but it sounds like you can get a little bit of everything. I'm kind of curious, was there people who you were just like, it's been so long since I've seen you and you were just calling them, hey. I think there were a few moments where you were going, wait, I know that guy. And but nice that we had the um, the 365 app, which served as the show app. And I would just fire that puppy up and say and look at that booth and go, oh, yeah, I know that guy. But <laughs> mo for the most part, I remembered everybody and they remembered me. Somebody might have called me Josh once. But you know what? I didn't care. We love Josh. Nice. Nice. If yeah, you're going to be that's... mistaken for someone. Josh is. Great. Um, yeah. And, and similar, you know, especially with the masks on. So it would be like, hi, Sandy. And I'm like, it's so great to see you. Thank you for coming. And then later it would be like, oh, that was so-and-so. And then the show was small enough and intimate enough that I could go back and find that person later and then uh, undo any awkwardness I had done previously. You know, actually the, the masks might come in handy that way. Cause then it's like, oh, I, I, I know you by your smile, not by the look in your eyes. So, hey, sorry. So interestingly enough, so now let's cut to a little bit. You two had an interesting conversation with Bill Giebler, who is the, the, the head honcho there at Nutrition Business Journal, at the show, summing up 
kind of what was going on at the show. And I think we have a little bit of between two ferns uh, situation going on here. So Charlie, why don't you roll that tape and let's get a little taste of what was happening right there in Secaucus, New Jersey, just last week. Hi, I'm Sandy Almendara, Senior Content Director at Informa Markets, and we have just wrapped Supply Side East in Secaucus, New Jersey. Woo, Woo cheers. 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 And I am cheersing here with Bill Giebler, who is the Content and Insights Director at Nutrition Business Journal, and Steve Myers, who is our Content Director for Natural Products Insider. So we're just a few content directors giving our takeaways from the show. I'm going to start with Steve and just ha let you take it open-ended. What do you want to, what's on your heart to talk about from the show? Well, I mean, first off, we're back and, and really we come to these shows and we're excited to see everybody every time there's a show and we're, we're hungry for the trends and the new ingredients. And, and, you know, we do like to see that here t this week, but, you know, really it was the talk that was always initiated with, we're back, we're so happy to be here, we're just, we're just excited to see everyone and connect again. And, and honestly, that, that is the lead, that we're back and everyone's happy to be here. For sure. And I heard how like, the in-person is so important, which, I mean, that could be self-serving as an event company to say that. Um, but it really, it just, people have missed the connection. I, yeah, I, I heard that. I think 100% of the booths I talked to, uh, the suppliers I talked to, they're just really happy to be back anywhere, right? But to be back having face-to-face -face conversations. And when I asked about the size of the show or the amount of traffic, everyone was, was pretty pleased. It's like having deeper conversations, having a little bit more time. Um, so, you know, not a, I mean, everyone was just really excited about there being any traffic and good conversations. So be, beyond just the hugging, if, if, if people were comfortable hugging and, and we're so happy to be back, what were, where were the conversations going for you? And it's funny you say hugging, you know, like the masks. It, it felt like always one person in a conversation had the mask on and yeah. the other person had the mask off. And it's like, oh, now which, wait, which one of us changed? <laughs> yeah. um, not a lot of hugging. I had a few conversations just about, you know, what was the last year like and a lot of, discussion of supply chain dis disruptions, which isn't surprising, but it was interesting to hear it right right from these suppliers. Um, logistics challenges, things like that, and, uh, um, and just kind of navigating where things are going next. Yeah, I mean, I think that there really, ha there's this narrative that, that our industry is doing so well, and it is, right? I mean, people have been more aware of their health because of the COVID pandemic, and I mean, you even presented data that you know, people are less satisfied with their general health than they were just a few years ago, and which leads them presumably to, to natural products to help improve their health. Um, but there are these pain points in the industry where it's not just like gangbusters, there are problems with supply chain. Well, th those have cleared up generally, but the logistics and packaging and, and, and things like that. And I know Steve, you talked to uh, someone who offers packaging I did, you know, I talked to a lot of booths and what was really interesting about what Bill just um, introduced for us, this supply chain and what happened to you over the past year, everyone had a different story, right? But most of the people mentioned something about bottles and caps or lids and even the pump tops because we all know the thousands of hand sanitizer and people who just dabbled in hand sanitizers to help boost the supply. And the demand just outpaced the ability to produce those. It wasn't the same issue as with ingredients where your ingredient comes from a region of the world that had been shut down or there's a logistic problem, like Bill mentioned, of getting it from that point A to the States. But it was more to do with this demand and even stateside production, do we have the machinery to fulfill the demand? Do we have the people to work there to fulfill the demand? And then we've got to get this out to our customers. Are there enough truckers to get it to the customer or to the port. And then once it's to the port, all those other logistics ingredients are facing. So the problem it seems to be with packaging wasn't so much getting the materials to make the package, but it was the demand outpacing their ability to keep up. And what they told, with at least the one booth told me today was they're catching up or at least they're caught up on bottles, caps are still an issue, that they feel better about where they're going um, and then the question became, well, now you're increasing your capacity, you're adding machines. What happens when we finally start to, 
um, right out of this pandemic, will the, if the demand goes down, are you stuck with machineries? And they didn't believe so. They thought, okay, people might dial back a little bit with that big bump in supplement use, but that'll still be much higher than where it was. So they felt good about their ability to meet demand going forward. Yeah. I heard that about labor too. I think that was interesting. Um, just having trouble getting labor in mills or in, in areas and with food ingredients even, not so much health, particularly health ingredients or nutraceutical ingredients, but just food ingredients. Demand was up for cereal grains because people weren't eating out as much. So the, the big CPGs were buying more food ingredients uh, than they had forecast. So it just like increased demand across the board, challenges on labor, and then if, if international or whatever, um, the logistics challenges. So really interesting time. Yeah, and on that international point, I mean, I was talking with people and, then, and it's like, it's, it's, there are fewer workers, like, I mean, uh, dock workers or people who are involved in shipping to begin with. And then also those like the crews that travel from, you know, internationally, then in addition to all of the pent up demand, those crews have to quarantine. Right. So they'll they'll go and then they'll come, you know, they'll go from come from China, come here, go back. And then they have then they quarantine for two weeks. So that's taking on additional time that they they're not able to work um, because of the quarantine restrictions that are in place because of covid. Um, and and then just international also conversations and meeting people. And I, I just I spoke about how important it is to be meeting in person. But, you know, you there's I, I talked to one someone at a booth and they have a, a new CEO that they haven't met in two years and and they can't because they you know, it's I mean, it's possible for them to meet, but it requires, you know, 14 day quarantines coming into the US and then three weeks come, you know, afterwards. So for a, a week long meeting, it would you know take two months. So it's just not feasible. Yeah, onboarding is pretty tough. I talked to some people been in the industry for a long time and they actually did switch jobs, switch companies, but they haven't been to the new headquarters. You know, they, everything's been done in a remote way. So perhaps even this show was the first time they could connect with people they now work with. So that's a pretty interesting scenario. I'm curious what you, you both heard about adulteration. From, from where I sit at NBJ, we report on it as a, as a theoretical reality, you know, it, or just a theoretical really sitting out there that there must be adulteration. There's such increased demand on ingredients like elderberry. And then, so of course there's adulteration, but we don't see it. We're, it feels like we're always talking to the reputable companies who are talking about it. I just wonder if you've seen anything that came up on the show floor today, adulteration, but the people who are talking about it, of course, are the ones who have vertical, are vertically integrated and have control over making sure that's not happening. Yeah. I mean, people who are practicing in adulteration or, you know, economically motivated that they know about, they're probably not talking about it, of course. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's certainly coming up, especially with like things like elderberry earlier in the pandemic that was, you know, such in high demand. And then, you know, with any kind of botanical, especially that is in high demand, it's, you know, it's a risk for adulteration. So I did ask about the testing uh, testing labs and how that's going because I'm seeing like, you know, contract manufacturers, like there's a long line for contract manufacturers. There's a long line for packaging, but it, it's, it seems that the labs are not suffering those long lead times, or if they are, it's just a few days or a few weeks. It's not something that's significant. So that the testing is still going on among these reputable companies. Yeah, I didn't hear anybody talk about adulteration this week, but for sure, you know, the recipe's there. Adulteration is an ongoing problem, especially, you know, with botanicals. And it, the recipe is there, this, the, the setting is there. You've got this high demand. And in some, in some cases for certain ingredients, it's, they're hard to get. You have an availability issue or a pricing issue, or both at the same time. And so, yes, when that happens, whether it's a botanical or even a protein, um, we're gonna start seeing that soon with protein, availability, significant price increases, it's going to happen. It's a matter of when they find it and if they can figure out a way to weed that out. But it's going to be tough when you can get a supply of something. Are you going to go through the, the procedures you should to make sure it's authentic material? So I think if we're not hearing it this week, we will hear it. Yeah. I mean, you, ha you have to, right? I mean, you yeah. just, I mean, 
Yeah, and I think many of the companies that we work with and on the show floor do. Um, I, and I, but I want to talk about uh, in a, the innovation pipeline, right? Because I think that that has also been stymied with the pandemic. Um, I've heard conver conversations that it's, you know, if there's new, like the, the innovation that we're seeing is like new, new clinical trials or, or, or new, like new work on, you know, already marketed ingredients and, and CPG products, but there's not a lot of new products. Have you had those conversations? I really didn't have those conversations this week at this show. I, um, I talked to a bunch of companies at the show and tried to suss out if there was anything new and new to them at this point, like, oh yeah, th this was a newer released um, product in 2019. Like, it's sort of like there's this gap that didn't happen. I don't know if that show manifest. It's like they came back and those five years didn't happen. You know, so in that regard, there wasn't a lot, but I think you touched on a few of the challenges and one of the challenges is research. So if you're a company doing things right, and we talked to many this week, they were doing it right. You've got the development of your product, R&D. Then you've got the clinical trial sequence, you know, in vitro and maybe animal studies and human trials. So maybe you can do it in vitro, you know? But then as you start to move up towards human, that's kind of difficult to do in during a pandemic, right? So you've got that. And then you've got, if you're doing it right, and it's a newer substance, and I've encountered those this week, you've got an NDI filing, and that may be, that's a challenge. And then you've got a government that already is slow, and then how slow are they during a pandemic? So you've got all these challenges to bringing a product to market yeah. in this pandemic. So we didn't see a lot of, I mean, this isn't finished products, but we didn't see a lot of new, newly launched ingredients or anything really jumping out. And I think that's because while supplements were doing well, and it was a great time for companies to make money. They had all these issues they never had to consider in this way. It was more about, did you order the bottles and the caps? Oh, did you, did you set up the container um, at the port? Now it's these little aspects they, didn't, that they just took for granted and, and they had to spend their time on that. And so if you couldn't do those things like trials, you could, you could turn your attention to other things you could do. And so, yeah, we didn't see a lot of that, but I think, I think we will um, say through next year, I think it will be an explosion. Yeah. I think there was less of a call for innovation during 2020, right? I, I showed a slide yesterday about personalized nutrition had a dip in growth in 2020 because people weren't looking for the newest, greatest thing. They're just looking for an, an immune supplement or a multivitamin. So I, I think it just, just the mad scramble for nutrients slow down innovation for even from the consumer all the way from the consumer up the supply chain yeah that makes that makes a lot of sense and i mean we're talking about a lot of the problems in the industry but of course this has been like a very great time for sales and for consumer awareness and so bill i'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about well i like that you said consumer awareness because i heard everyone i asked said it was such a great year for sales the best year ever, but I haven't seen anyone, you know, whatever, there, there was always maybe a but, but they were like, yeah, it was the best year ever. Uh, but one person in particular put it that there's a, a big spike in consumer awareness, um, which it, I guess it makes sense. Like there's increased sales that must come from consumer awareness, but it just clicked for me when, when she put it that way. It's like, oh, that makes sense, you know? So um, I think it's gonna be interesting to see what happens with that going forward. What do we do with that consumer awareness? How do we keep those customers? And, uh, and yeah, and where does it go from here? And to clarify, for sure, when we were walking around the show floor and talking to booths, and we were talking about what they experienced and what they're still experiencing, and because these things have to cycle through, even if something in the supply chain improves, it's, it's gotta cycle through. So despite talking about these things, every single booth I talked to about these, even someone who had an immunity ingredient during that time when it was booming and couldn't get it because it was from a region that shut down. Even someone like that, was, they were positive and said, we still did well. We're very happy about what, what transpired last year. We feel really good going in and we feel like we'll keep, we'll keep some of the consumers, we'll keep a lot of that new business, maybe not all of it from the bump, but we'll keep a lot of it. So despite talking to us about those challenges, nobody talked about it negatively overall they were all very positive overall yeah well i think that's a great way to end it because i am also feeling very positive especially after the last two days here on supply side east thank you so much bill and steve for joining me thank you
hey, now that was an insider's insider conversation. I love that. I love just, I'm so glad that you're here to watch this, just to know it's like, how do you deal with logistics with the supply chain? And then, you know, we're fortunate that consumers are so engaged right now. So this is the chance to step up and be a pro. And you're a pro a little bit more because you're here on Insider in the Afternoon. So uh, for the last bit, I'm going to cue it up for Sandy because you were there with uh, Ladora Brown. So why don't you take it away and introduce this whole segment? Yeah, thanks, Todd. So this next clip is a conversation that I had with Ladora A. Brown from Blue Grace Logistics and Amy Summers from Anicia Vox and Pitch Publicity. And the two of them held a workshop on the second day of Supply Side um, called Communicating Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Lessons Learned from Elephant in the Room. And in this workshop, attendees got sat in small round tables and really got to discuss with each other practical ways that companies within our industry can communicate with diverse audiences and create a more inclusive and supportive work environment. Um, I loved the workshop. It was really great. And this is a really great conversation that I'm happy to queue up here. Thanks, Todd. And hi, everyone. I am Sandy Almendares, Senior Content Director at Informa Markets, and I'm here on site at Supply Side East in Secaucus, New Jersey. It's so wonderful to be back in person. And I am in person sitting with Amy Summers, who is the founder and president of Pitch Publicity and Anisi Vox, and also with Ladora A. Brown, who is the Senior Public Relations Manager at Blue Grace Logistics. Earlier today, when we're recording, Amy and Ladora led an insightful and just amazing workshop on how to better communicate diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. And so this was based off of a series that Anicia Vox did called The Elephant in the Room. So first, welcome Amy, welcome Ladora. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Sandy. Thanks, so happy to be here. Um, could you first just explain what this series was and how it came together? Sure. So um, we really were impressed by a social media campaign that popped up shortly after the George Floyd killing called Blackout Tuesday. So if you remember, everyone was hashtag Blackout Tuesday and people were posting just black squares on their social media. And it was a day to just listen and learn and, and elevate black voices. And it kind of extended, you know, throughout the week. And after that, um, Lador and I, you know, were just talking about how impressive it was that this just came out of nowhere and people really did learn a lot. And we were just curious as communications professionals, you know, what if we took the same idea and expanded it a little bit more into a virtual seminar series? And so that's how identifying the elephant in the room came about last fall. And so who was, who was in this series? How did you find these professionals? Yeah, so we, we utilize our own networks. Um, I graduated from Howard University in Washington, D.C., a mid-Atlantic HBCU. Amy went to University of Florida, a Southern, of course. And we wanted to see how these groups work together, talking, discussing these topics and ideas. So we um, went to both schools to try to figure out which student organizations we would be best, the best fit to host our seminar series, our virtual seminar series as well as utilizing some professionals in our own networks who are communications professionals in different industries, politics, healthcare, um, news media, fashion and beauty, et cetera, or sports. So um, yeah, it was about 15, about 30 professionals and students over a course of six different series through the fall semester of 2020. Um, and that's how we came together. That's great. And so in today's presentation or workshop, you showed clips, just for the audience at home who wasn't here, you showed clips and then prompted groups of tables to discuss among, not colleagues, but people within the industry, people who they didn't, didn't work with. And so uh, really, really great conversations came out of it. And so I just wanna highlight a few of them. And you know, we live in a time full of lots of news and lots of easy access to news. And so the, these conversations, the, the, these uh, world events or national events happen, how, can people discuss this at work? And, and what were the, some of the takeaways from this morning on that? Yeah, I think um, the clip that we showed was from our sports panel and, and one of our professionals um, who was in the news media and sports, you know, brought up this, uh, this fact that, you know, like when something happens, you know, we're still people. So even though we're professionals and we're working in the same industry and we have that in common, 
we're all people that are coming from different walks of life. And so, you know, recently, you know, what's been in the news constantly is what's going on in Afghanistan. So looking at just uh, recognizing that these world events that are happening or these national events that are happening affect the people that you work with every day. And you're at work most of the day. <laughs> so trying to create a constructive place to have those conversations. Absolutely. Um, it's important to lean in on the people that you work with and that work for you to realize that they have lives outside of work um, and they could be having something completely going on in the background in their lifestyle that could actually affect how they work in your office space. So allowing them to have room to express any emotions or feelings that are going on with these world global events or something happening in the community, that if anything, it's only gonna help the, the workplace function better. So true. And speaking of expression and, and this, and Amy, you said you are, you're working all day, but we're working in a very different way than we have even two years ago because of the pandemic. So there was a discussion that came up about professionalism and, and what is a professional look and what is professionalism today? So could you, you give me some highlights there? Yeah, this is an interesting one because I think, you know, it it evolves as, as culture evolves, as we evolve. We just all went through a pandemic and lockdown. And, you know, I mean, to, to define what professionalism looks like, I think it's different in everyone's in everyone's head. But it's not something we often discuss, but it's an important topic to bring up in the workplace. And I think we were sharing an example of this earlier. Yeah, one example would be professional hair. Um, for example, you know, African-Americans may wear their hair differently, um, different styles on a weekly, monthly basis. It's, they're not necessarily gonna look the same or they may look the same every single time. It's just, a, it's a individuality type of stamp that you wanna put on the world is how you present yourself. And it's not gonna be the same as what you may think traditionally looks professional. So being accepting of that is really important as well as maybe even someone who wears tat has tattoos or a piercing in their face, or it's not necessarily gonna be exactly what you thought of 20 years ago. I mean, the world is different now. And I think it's really important for large corporations as well as small corporations or companies to understand that their workforce is gonna look different from what it did before and to accept that and, and to understand that, you know, maybe if that's not the culture you wanna present at your workplace, that's up to you, but it's also up to the person who you're looking to hire to decide if they wanna work in that environment as well. It goes both ways. Right. So it's true like, to be very upfront in when you're hiring people as to what the culture, what you yeah. expect. And, and I think of, you know, I just said we're all working from home, but that's not entirely true. There's a lot, a large part of this industry that is their manufacturing they or testing. They have to be on site doing something. And, and there's rules because of GMPs, the good manufacturing practices or GLPs, good laboratory practices about jewelry and things like, like that. So I just thought it was interesting to, to try to like, what is the balance between the, these, these standards that you have to follow to be compliant with regulations versus being, being able to express yourself? Yeah, and I think it's important for, to not, as a, the boss or the manager, to not, not just slide past those questions. Um, you know, you might have an employee ask, what should I wear to this client dinner? you know, they might need to know a little bit more about how you expect them to present themselves in front of client. And that may vary from client to client. It may vary from if it's a Zoom meeting or not, but I think getting more specific, because we do live in a very um, expressive culture now, we're expressing everything all the time. Um, and so there's not this standard and people, they do want to present themselves in a way that you um, want them to, um, or at least have a discussion about it so that you're not having anxiety about, is it okay if I wear pants to this meeting or, you know, or do I have to wear heels? You know, that type of thing. Right. Right. And the last point I want to talk, I could talk to you guys about this all day. But <laughs> we can talk about it all day. Too. <laughs> but the last thing I want to talk about is um, on this video is the, the aspect of the leadership and how that is so important in a cult, in a business operation that it, it really it should be coming top down so that you can listen bottom up. Can you t talk more about that? Yeah, I, I want to say that leadership people will take on the whatever the leadership um, puts forth for the company organization. So it's really important that our leaders are opening to listening to what's happening around us and bringing that into the workplace as well as any issues that are happening from the ground up, like you said. Um, I think it's important to create a workspace where 
they shouldn't, employees shouldn't feel intimidated to talk to their supervisors about certain issues that are affecting them because we're people at the end of the day. We're not just work bots, we're people. And it's okay to have these conversations to make us feel welcome and open in, in this environment so that we can be our, our most productive selves. Amy, anything to add? You might yeah, know a little bit about being a leader of a company. Yeah, I think too, just, you know, when you're in charge or you're in that position of power where you're in charge of everybody, you don't have to know everything. And I think admitting that sometimes is helpful. So to say, um, and I think in our one of the clips that we showed, um, one of our executives from NBC Universal, she she said, I I go to my team and I say, I don't want to make this decision by myself. May I have permission to ask you what your opinion is. And I think, again, asking permission um, to get some feedback is great. And, you know, that is how we learn and that's how we know how to create a better environment. It's not on management and the executives to figure it all out. It is a collaborative thing. We want to obviously serve who is working for us. So we want to know what their input may be. So it's okay to ask and you're not gonna look like you don't know what you're doing or you don't have it all together because things change all the time anyway, so you're not expected to always know how people feel Absolutely. on certain issues. Yeah, and it could vary from person to person. A, a person may not feel the same as another person in their cultural group as the next, you know? So it's important to get as, as much feedback as you can to come up with a cohesive decision-making mm -hmm. policy, I would say. Yeah, and even going outside of your company. Someone, exactly. someone mentioned earlier today that we all have access to the internet. We can. There's, there's resources out there. So yes, absolutely go to your employees to feel how, to see how they feel about things, but there's resources out there and, and we can take that on us to, to learn more. And everybody wants to be heard, you know what I mean? So just even giving your team the opportunity to um, express how they feel or to provide input um, obviously, if you're going to ask, you need to do something with that. So don't just ask and keep going business as usual. It's not a box checking thing. But if you're going to get that feedback, then you're then as the leader, now you are responsible and should be accountable for starting to slowly make those changes. So it, once you listen and you hear it, now you have to do something and be the leader and implement it. And when the, when your team sees that you're doing that, that's going to build trust. And they're going to open up to you more about things because they're, they're going to say, well, the last time we had a discussion, this changed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Amy Ladora, for joining me on the video, for work, doing the workshop earlier today. It was so great. And be before we close, is how can we get our hands on these clips? Yeah, so the content is so rich. I mean, Ladora and I put this on together and we keep watching it again and again. So we wanted to make it available to everybody. And so you can access it at enisivox.com backslash live. And the whole series is there. Great. Thank you so much. Back to you, Todd. All right. Well, thanks for all that. Don't you just like getting that little taste of real live people and uh, just some cool insider stuff on how to um, be a better more inclusive, uh, just a more efficient business. I know I did. And for more, Supply Side West, coming right up October 25th to 28th in Vegas. And go to SupplySideWest.com to uh, register and get your uh, rings on your fingers and bells on your shoes and rhinestones on your cowboy. We will see you there. Thanks for joining us again today. We'll see you next week on Insider in the Afternoon.